Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth and final lecture in the series of health and healthcare, organized by a group of Max Weber fellows at the European University Institute. Thank you for joining us today. We are delighted to have Professor Jane Gingrich from the University of Oxford. Jane is a professor of comparative political economy at the University of Oxford and Magdalen College. Her research focuses on structural reforms to welfare and education systems. Her first book, Making Markets in the Welfare State, uh, looked at marketization of health and education. Her recent work has examined feedback effects of welfare and education reforms and the institutional determinants of political behavior. She's currently working on a project on changing phase of social democratic parties and an ERC project on the development education system across countries in the post-war period. Today's talk is based on her forthcoming book, Aging and Health, The Politics of Better Policies, which will be coming out in July from Temperature University Press. Uh, this book is co-authored with several other scholars, including Scott Greer, who gave a talk in this series uh, two weeks ago. So the way um, it goes is, first, uh, Jane will give us a um, presentation for about 30, 30 minutes, uh, which is followed by a question and answer. If you have any questions, um, type a chat um, or a raise, use raise hand function. Without further ado, Jane, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Takuya, for having me. And I we were talking earlier that I'm a, a former Max Weber fellow, so it's nice to be back virtually um, with the program. Although I think it would be nicer to be there in real in real life and uh, back in Florence. Um, but um, uh, this is the world we're in right now. Um, so it's a real privilege to get the chance to speak here. Um, and I think one thing that will come out in this presentation from this volume is how much um, many of the people at the EUI have been deeply influential to our collective thinking about uh, the questions we have, in particular, the work um, by both um, Ellen Immergut and Anton Hemrick in terms of sort of structuring the way in which we're thinking about life course policies and the, the way in which coalitions around them sometimes emerge. So I'm really interested to the, in the feedback of, of this group. Um, a little bit of a word on the volume that I'm presenting. So this is a book that was co-authored with a large group, as you can see from the title slide. Scott Greer, Julie Lynch, John Silas, Michelle Falkenbach, myself, Aaron Reeves, and Claire Bambra. And when we came together, as we're, we come from different disciplines. So a number of us are political scientists and that would include myself, um, public health people, um, economists and sociologists. And the idea was to kind of come together and think about this question of healthy aging and what, what we actually want to say about healthy aging. And that was inspired, I think, um, generally by a sense that the, the rhetoric about healthy aging often presented the um, trajectory as one in which there's, uh, to sort of um, paraphrase an old, uh, to paraphrase the sort of classic claim um, uh, where you have a moving force against sort of an immovable object. object. Healthcare, aging, healthcare and aging is often thought of in that framework in that aging will, will automatically produce um, increased costs, particularly for healthcare systems. But because there's actors that are extremely vested in those systems, and particularly they're vested um, as both voters and political parties mobilize around older voters, what we'll see in the long run is uh, an increasingly stark set of trade-offs around spending that will often sort of pit the old against the young. And this is sort of the rhetoric in part behind this kind of common language of a looming, uh, a looming crisis in healthcare driven by aging that this slide is, is getting at. And that there's, there's sort of no way to solve this in some regard. Um, and, and thus the sort of idea that, um, you know, you have to think uh, of sort of dramatic solutions to the aging crisis. Okay, this rests on basically three claims, which the purpose of the book is essentially to contest. Um, so the first is that um, aging will create necessarily rising healthcare costs, um, which will in turn either require fiscal austerity or create a sharp trade-off between support for healthy aging and other forms of social investment or welfare spending. So the first, that's the first claim. The second claim is that in the face of this trade-off, new cleavages are likely to emerge between the old and the young, 
And the third claim is that politicians are likely to fairly uniformly pursue the interests of the elderly to the exclusion of other groups. And what we do in the book is we try to sort of disaggregate each of these claims from um, a, a series of perspectives, starting with the um, claims about healthcare spending and moving through the political claims. So I'm going to walk through in this talk the first um, set of claims about costs. And then we're going to develop our alternative approach, with, which emphasizes the life course. And then we're going to come back to a series of questions about sort of where and when do we actually see the institutionalization of, of a life course perspective. So the first sort of set of questions, the, the big claim of the book is in some regards, aging really isn't as important as this kind of rhetoric about a looming healthcare crisis would suggest. Um, and it's not as important on an economic perspective in that um, uh, the, while well, aging is certainly likely to put strains on contemporary welfare states um, and particularly pension systems, um, healthcare systems are a little more resilient than, than many of these arguments would suggest. But secondly, and I think this is really the key argument that the, volume, the book wants to drive home is that when we think about aging and the cost of aging, it's the sort of nature of trade-offs between expenditure on the old and expenditure on the young um, aren't constant across places. That there is a degree to which the extent to which aging actually strains the welfare state is somewhat endogenous to earlier investments that welfare states have already made in the young. And so where there's more investments in the young, and this is the, the life course perspective, it often leads to healthier aging and sort of longer periods of activity and uh, both workforce participation and lower costs in the long run in ways that can, that can change the cost of aging. And so as a result, we need to understand as, uh, in, on the political side, where and when these kinds of institutionalizations of sort of cross-class coalitions and cross-generational coalitions actually can emerge and the way in which um, they emerge as stable coalitions in some places and vulnerable coalitions in others. And this to us is a more important set of questions than just saying sort of who wins and loses from aging per se. So to begin with, what is aging? So I think everyone uh, probably in this call is sort of familiar with these kinds of data, uh, but there's basically two major drivers and both of these are alleged to put, sort of put strains that cause a trade-off in spending, um, the nature of spending in, in, within the welfare state. So the first is the, um, is the extension of the human lifespan. So aging is partly driven by sort of more people making it to old age and then within old age, people living longer. And so when we look forward, we, ask, we, we um, have seen sort of an increase in uh, life expectancy, both at birth and then from 65 in the last years. And there, if you take sort of OECD estimates going forward, the share of people likely to in the population, um, well, so both of those things have happened. At the same time, we've seen falling birth rates in many countries, uh, in pretty much all countries, but falling extreme drops in birth rates in some countries that have changed the sort of ratio of the elderly in the population. And so when we look forward, um, we can anticipate that there'll be an increase in the percentage of people both over 65 and, and then due to this sort of changing of the, of the ratios, but then if the share of people in the oldest old group of over 80s over time due to increased longevity. And that's what these data, which probably everyone's sort of familiar with um, suggest. Okay. So the trade-off log just basically suggests that when we have this extension of both the um, human life expectancy and um, the decline of birth rates, this basically creates two forms of pressure on the welfare state. One is a direct pressure that arises from um, the costs of aging themselves. And so both healthcare and long-term care costs associated with the elderly. And then the second cost emerges from an increase in dependency ratio. So the rising share of um, elderly or people who are out of the labor force relative to those in the lab labor force. And in a kind of classic trade-off argument, what this does is it pits, um, it, it adds a sort of need for expenditure on the elderly grows with um, 
an aging population and the amount of resources becomes more constrained by changes in the dependency ratio, one get, receives, a, oh, there's in it, or I should say in politics, the, the effect is a growing trade-off between so-called social consumption, which is targeted more at the elderly and social investment, which is targeted more at the young. And this logic assumes sort of a uniform kind of um, crowding out as costs go, grow with the number of elderly, that's going to push, um, push back on investment programs or require cutbacks for that group. So this argument I think will be well familiar to everyone, um, but it forms the core of the um, book and what partly what we're trying to do uh, through this sort of cross um, disciplinary study of actually the health effects of different forms of investment. So the core claim here is actually investment in the young often allays the cost of aging in both regards. So it both makes um, for a longer trajectory of healthy elderly. So it reduces some of the costs in the elderly period of the life cycle. And it expands the capacity of kind of younger elderly people to continue in the labor force or continue to participate in forms of unpaid care that, lead, that are crucial to sustaining um, the well being of the older elderly. And so that but neither the sort of direct costs of aging nor the sort of indirect costs via worsening of the dependency ratio necessarily have uniform effects. So what is the evidence for this? So the first set of evidence comes from a series of papers that the European Observ Observatory commissioned and that one of the co-authors from the book, um, John Silas was a lead on, which looked to run a series of uh, models that estimate the effects of aging on actual healthcare expenditures. And the basic takeaway from these papers is that the effects are very modest. Um, and so they run a series of uh, models with differing degrees of, of assumptions about costs. And even in their most kind of conservative estimates where they assume that the elderly cost uh, on average about double the cost of, the, of young people in terms of healthcare consumption, they only find sort of an upward effect of under 1% of GDP driven uh, by 2060, driven by aging. And so in this regard, um, the, the sort of direct costs associated with healthcare consumption are actually more modest than the, the rhetoric would suggest. And the mechanism for that is that the younger, um, is that actually living above 80 um, is in some regards, um, and this is going to sound like it's sort of a mean way to speak, but, it, but it's true, it's that the people above 80 cost less to die in many regards than this sort of younger old group. Um, they're more likely to be in, a home, in, in their home and require less intensive medical interventions. And so the actual costs from a healthcare perspective of death happen right around the period of death, and those are not necessarily linear with age um, above 65. The second thing is when it comes to the long-term care of the elderly, again, um, the European observatory work that tries to estimate forward with modeling um, suggests that there will be an increase of costs in long-term care, but it comes from a relatively low baseline. And much of this actually um, uh, is critically underwritten by a key role for volunteerism of younger groups of elderly people who engage in substantial caregiving activities. And so again, there are costs absolutely associated with aging, but, um, but they're more manageable than the rhetoric of, about the direct healthcare costs of aging would suggest. Now, the dependency ratio arguments are more compelling in the sense that, um, that uh, a, a rise in the number of elderly that exit from the labor force may um, put tax burdens on younger populations in terms of supporting um, spending. But again, there's um, sort of mixed evidence on this in terms of thinking forward um, on the costs, um, in terms of sort of the relationship between spending on the elderly and spending on the other groups. So we know that um, from a series of kind of micro studies that um, people who are in, um, who, sorry, people with lower incomes or more challenging jobs physically through the, their adult years are more likely to exit from the labor force earlier um, than people who are of higher levels of education and have occupations um, that are less physically intensive. And so many of the, the sort of takeaway from that is actually many of the inequalities in the, through the life cycle also reflect into sort of the dependency ratio because where you have 
um, high levels of inequalities and particularly sort of large sectors of low paid work, those individuals are more likely to exit the labor force early. So the idea that there's sort of a straight mechanical effect of aging on um, the labor force, again, probably is not quite the case. It really depends on the structures of policies that support people during the life cycle. Um, and this applies even more when we think about women, which I'll come back to later. Um, and this, again, when we look cross-nationally, when we go from the sort of micro evidence up into the sort of more macro evidence about the age at which people exit the labor force, again, we see a huge amount of variation. And ma in many countries, people exit actually at a much older age than the statutory minimum. So the statutory minimum is where these blue dots are, and this is the average age of exit up here. And you can see that um, many people now are working to late 60s or even early, early 70s. Uh, across countries. And so again, this sort of mechanical effect of aging on dependency ratios partly depends on sort of how people's work is structured. This is for men. If I showed you the data for women as well, you'd see even more kind of scope there for um, some increase in activity. Okay. So what we argue instead is that um, if we think of the cost of aging as, good, as partially endogenous to what's happening to people over their actual childhood and working age, then in fact, um, the cost of healthy aging requires us to think about investment over the life course. If people enter old age um, early because they've had a, a, they've lived in poverty throughout their life and so they're entering um, in worse health having to exit the labor force early, um, or if they enter just in worse health and need to consume more resources, then that is cost potentially quite costly. Um, but but countries that invest over the life course, and we'll talk about this. I'll we'll talk about this more in a moment. Um, have more capacity for people to stay in the labor force longer and potentially enter old age in better health. And so the idea is, if we think about aging as a potential sort of crisis for the welfare state. It's actually not a crisis that's related necessarily to age or to sort of a change in the intergenerational benefits um, that it poses. It's a, it, it's a crisis in, the, in very likely, uh, or at least in our argument, in the way we invest in, in younger people as well and think about inequality over the life cycle. And this is where we really draw on and through the book on the public health literature. Um, and the sort of huge body of findings, uh, many of which have been produced by the co-authors of the book, and there are uh, other streams of research on the social determinants of health and the way in which, um, in fact, sort of uh, experience of poverty and inequality are bad for people's health, and they're bad for people's health in ways that sort of refract onto the, their capacity to age in a healthy way. So the, so the key question here is, okay, so if we think about life course, what do we see differently? Okay, so this is one thing um, of, so we reproduce in the book. It's not our picture, but um, we reproduce it just as a sort of reminder of the, the differences in, in life expectancy in a sort of a visually um, salient way. So this comes, um, for those of you who don't, probably many of you recognize this, but for those of you that don't, it's a sort of stylized version of a London, London underground, um, so the subway underground map. And it's showing just, if you move just a few stops on the London underground, um, you can have a life expectancy drop of close to seven years. And this visual impact is, it, the visualization is meant to sort of draw people's attention to the ways in which the neighborhoods we live in um, the jobs we have access to, our education and so on, shape our life course, li life chances in ways that substantially affect measurable health outcomes. Um, and in another part of the book, we look at things um, like infant mortality and changes in infant mortality that have, that in the UK that accompanied um, some of new labor's programs um, of investment in the young in the, um, in the 2000s. And so the idea is like, when we think about, uh, when we think about, health in old age, it's all the things that happen up to the point of someone um, actually entering old age that are shaping their potential to live in a healthy way and also some of the costs of that. So we need to, we need to move intellectually, I think, and normatively, at least that's the argument of this book, to the question of sort of how do we manage life course policies rather than thinking about this sort of strict trade-off between the consumption of the old and the consumption of the young because they affect each other in an interconnected way. 
And we can see this again when we look just at spending data. So here is um, data from EU Silk, uh, and it shows on the x-axis the percentage of elderly below the median income and the percentage of reporting good health on the y-axis. And again, like not surprisingly to those of you who work in this field, you can see that places like Norway, um, the Netherlands, Denmark that have high levels of um, uh, uh, low levels of elderly poverty also have high levels of elderly people that report good health. Um, a final kind of just piece of evidence from the book is a, a study that one of the co-authors, Claire Bamber, did on German life expectancy and what happened sort of post reunification. And this just shows men, um, the data look relatively similar for women, uh, but you can see that there's a, a divergence in um, the former GDR and the Federal Republic in the 1980s in terms of life expectancy. And then a fairly rapid convergence upwards um, in the post uh, 1995 period uh, where there's substantial, again, transfers that are happening um, from, e from west to east in terms of support for people, not just targeting the elderly, but the full life cycle. Okay, so what does this suggest? It suggests that healthy aging requires um, people to enter old age on healthy terms, not just devoting resources to the old. And politically, it suggests a non-zero sum relationship between inter and intra, inter and intragenerational inequality. So high levels of intragenerational inequality, so that's inequality within a generation, can exasperate the costs of aging and potentially undermine coalitions around healthy aging. Um, in ways that prevent, that can sort of then create um, the kinds of intergenerational conflicts that this, this literature suggests. So our interest is in, okay, so how do we move beyond that? So we conceptualize institutional differences in sort of four ways. Um, the, we both in terms, sorry, on two dimensions, in terms of the degree of intragenerational inequality and the degree of intergenerational inequality. And what we're essentially interested in is sort of how do you get to this quadrant where you have both inter and intragenerational inequality? And what politically distinguishes that from those that have more sort of age focused welfare states versus those um, that are more universal but smaller in size? So I'm going to show you some data on this um, and um, then we can, we can move on. So this comes from a replication that we did of um, earlier work by Julie Lynch. So Julie Lynch in 2006 wrote a book called Age in the Welfare State. She's one of the co-authors on this project. Um, and what Lynch develops in her 2006 book is um, a, con a way to conceptualize the age bias of welfare states. And so she develops a ratio of spending on older people that includes um, uh, taking sort of essentially the ratio of pension survivors benefits and a range of other policies relative to um, family benefits, unemployment benefits, and incapacity, uh, sorry, and active labor market policies. It does not include just education. And it, we also don't make strong assumptions about health. Um, if we put education in and we modeled health in terms of the actual sort of breakdown of elderly to non-elderly, those would sort of wash out. And so the ratio that we have here is sort of a, a, a measure of the actual intensity that different welfare states have in terms of um, expenditure on the elderly. And what you can see is the welfare states that um, up, are up at the top, Greece, Japan, Italy, United States, are all um, strongly sort of pro-elderly in the spending structure, whereas um, Sweden, the Netherlands, Norway, Ireland, UK are actually sort of more youth focused in their structure. These are ratios. When we plot these on um, a two by two, so we look at elderly spending as a percentage of GDP versus non-elderly spending as a percentage of GDP, we begin to see um, the two dimensions that I discussed uh, on the previous slide emerge in practice. So places like um, Japan, Portugal, Greece, et cetera, they target substantial resources in relative terms to the elderly, but they underspend on the non-elderly um, compared to other OECD countries. By contrast, um, the US, Canada, New Zealand, so these are English language countries down here, they don't spend that much on both. Although the US is what it does spend is more targeted towards the elderly. 
Um, and then you have up in this quadrant, these are sort of the ones that do both. Um, so the, not surprisingly, the Nordic countries, but also France and Austria emerge as both substantial spenders on the old and the young. So does this matter? Um, well, we can see again, there's different configurations of poverty. This is just using OECD data. Um, so we have the share of the elderly who are poor on the Y axis, uh, sorry, on the X axis and the share of the working age who are poor on the um, X axis, uh, sorry, on the Y axis. And what we see uh, up here, not surprisingly, uh, Greece, Spain, Italy, much um, higher share of non-elderly poor than elderly, um, low shares of both in the Nordic countries, the Netherlands, France, and then in Eastern Europe, we see um, very high shares of both groups um, in like Estonia and Latvia and so on. And then a more sort of mixed group where they actually there's more elderly poor than um, non-elderly. Now to return to this, what we can see though, is that over time, um, the age ratios are becoming less pro-elderly in a number of countries. So we see a movement towards social investment to some extent actually taking off. Now this, this in, in principle, we can't tell by looking at these ratios if this is driven primarily by cutbacks in spending on the elderly or an expansion of spending on the non-elderly. And in practice, when we look um, more carefully, it's driven by a, a bit of both. Uh, but there has been, at least in the pre-financial crisis period, there was an important beginning of expansion to the non-elderly groups that began to remediate these ratios and in some ways probably provide um, a step forward in terms of thinking about life course policies. But these have proven to be less resilient uh, potentially politically than, um, the, than other kinds of reforms. And so what we have on this slide is these data come from the Luxembourg income study. And what they're modeling is the, or what they're showing, sorry, is the percentage um, who are poor after redistribution and the relative reduction of poverty between um, the, um, the 1990s, uh, late 1990s and the 2010s. And what we, you can see on the left-hand side is two things. First, the welfare state does a lot to reduce elderly poverty, um, although it varies in how much it does in all cases. But the key thing is that pretty much everyone reduces in the amount of poverty uh, post redistribution in the elderly group. And that's not surprising because most elderly don't work. So it'd be sort of surprising if the welfare state didn't actually reduce, uh, reshape the income redistribution, to some, income distribution to some extent. Um, but what's secondly important, and this is the nature of all these errors going up, is that this has remained relatively resilient over time. By contrast, when we look at the non-elderly, here again, the x-axis shows the percent poor um, after redistribution and the y-axis shows relative um, redistribution of the welfare state. What you can see is there's both more cross-sectional heterogeneity in patterns in terms of the extent of redistribution and more temporal differences. And so we're not seeing all those arrows moving in this direction as in redistribution is actually increasing over time. We see a substantial difference. Um, Across, across countries, both temporally and cross-sectionally. So the key thing is um, life course policies work to some extent. Um, we, we try to show that at the micro level and at the macro level, um, they exist. So they're not politically impossible, but they're also not universal um, and they're potentially more politically vulnerable. So the question then is why are these solutions so difficult and what can we learn from the varied institutionalization of life course policies that will help us think about healthy aging? So basically um, there's sort of three, I think insights that come from a variety of these literatures um, in terms of why these kind of policies are difficult to institutionalize in the long run. So the first comes from Lynch um, and Lynch argues that, look, these policies go back to the early founding of the welfare state in the period of, uh, of partisan mobilization in the 1920s to 1950s in which you had parties with very different strategic um, incentives in terms of mobilizing older and younger voters. And in some cases they built sort of age biased welfare states and in some cases they didn't. And so this sort of presents a long shadow of history and explains some of these cross-sectional um, differences. But as we saw, you know, these things are not entirely path dependent. There has been some, some change even in the short time period of the 2000s, the 1990s uh, and 2000s and 2010s. 
So a second kind of way of explaining this is comes from say work by Alan Jacobs and others. And, and, they, and Jacobs argues, look, it's really hard to get policymakers to invest in the long-term. And there's a very specific set of constellation of factors that actually allow that. And those only emerge in some cases. So you need both the incentives to do it and a degree of insulation politically from, in, um, from, from um, uh, electoral mobilization, mobilization against, um, against these kinds of policies. And that, that he provides a way of thinking about the conditions under which that might happen. Um, a third kind of uh, approach, which is quite dominant in contemporary thinking about this is sort of the ways in which inst the institutionalization of different groups may occur across systems. And so um, here we might see the kind of investment consumption divide in preferences if and when it exists, which it doesn't at all times, but it could line up with other kinds of divisions that are institutionalized in party systems, um, for instance, between insiders and outsiders. And so we have a lot of theoretical apparatus to explain the conditions under which we're likely to see um, sort of a lack of these kind of what we think of as win-win life course policies. What we also, but we also know these are not destiny. And so, so there's sort of two questions then. One is we have a strong um, uh, belief that when, or claim that's evidenced to some extent in the book, um, that when age, when policies become more sort of dominated around intergenerational conflict, it's very, like, very likely to be bad for healthy aging because it undermines that investment in the young. And so the example of this comes from the UK over the last decade, where we have an increasing age gradient on voting. Um, and that's um, uh, associated with um, a growing fragmentation in the political preservation of benefits for the old and the young. But equally, um, it, uh, cross generation coalitions or intergenerational coalitions that are sort of built around high levels of system inequality are also likely to be bad for um, healthy aging uh, because they um, institutionalize sort of narrow distributions of wealth in ways that might undercut investment um, in families and young people in ways that are inequality reducing. So we kind of um, like much of, I think, comparative political economy, we're sort of searching for this kind of Goldilocks outcome. How do you get a sort of across intergenerational, intragenerational coalition that really invests in the life course? Um, so we think that this isn't driven as much by demand side politics as by sort of mobilizing coalitions in a stable way. Um, and one path forward that we suggest in the book is through the politicization of gender in the family. So women and families in general are the home of an intergenerational, well, families are the home of a kind of intergenerational pact. Um, so people share with their children and they also share across generations within their family. Um, and when we go back to the kind of the history of building many of these kind of more a life cycle focused states in which we see investment in the old and we see investment in the young that is promoting healthy aging, we often see um, in line with work on sort of gender in the Nordic welfare states, some um, real politicization of gender in ways that has allowed um, a much more stable coalition put forward on sort of inter intergenerational and intragenerational um, coalitions. And so the question, and to show that, um, we then look at uh, political parties' preferences, and here we're looking at it, education preferences, because it's one of the few things in the comparative manifesto data that we have that is age focused. Um, but what we what we do here is we we break apart party mentions by types of families in Europe um, in the 90s and more recently on the left and the right. And what you can see is that um, there's a gradient, well, there's differences across left-wing parties in how much they mentioned education in the early 90s, but it, they, these grow substantially. There's much more variation across political parties in the 2010s. And the same is the case on the right. Um, so this includes liberal, conservative, Christian democratic parties. Uh, but what's important is if you look up here, the, the places where you have the most sort of consistent discussion of education and party manifestos, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, Finland, 
uh, Austria. And you actually look over here on the right, you see many of the same Denmark, Sweden, and so on, um, that have the, both the political left and the political right have institutionalized in rhetoric, at least discussions of youth based issues. We see a much more sort of stable set of investment um, across the life course than places in which this is either highly partisan associated with just the left um, or in which um, we see very little discussion. So we see a depoliticization of youth in ways um, that lead to sort of age focused policies that are not life course based. So this leads us, um, leads me to conclude um, in terms of what, where the book is going is, it's if you buy our perspective on the life course that really we need to think about aging, not as a cost that is driving things at the end of the life, but as something that can be allayed by investment through the life cycle. And if you think um, as we do that, there's a potential to create these coalitions, but they certainly don't emerge, uh, coalitions that invest in the life course, but they certainly don't emerge automatically. Um, then the question is sort of, is there actual advice for thinking about policy or thinking about sort of pushing this forward? And I think one of the lessons of COVID in the moment we're in right now is that a lot of the old constraints um, are sort of temporarily lifted and we're talking about policies that look very different than the policies that were on the agenda a decade ago. Uh, but some of the old politics is also rearing its head in terms of um, backlash to, to these kinds of um, policies of income security. And so the question for um, us, at least thinking about healthy aging is can more, in, in the sort of shadow of COVID, can more sort of, can or will more stable coalitions around healthy aging emerge that really do take this life cycle perspective, which has been, I think, thrown in fairly stark, uh, under fairly stark light um, by the very unequal impacts of the pandemic across um, both countries based on their sort of macro level inequality, but also across individuals um, position. And so this is sort of um, where I will conclude. Thank you very much.